Welcome everyone and um, a friend of mine, whenever she's quite nervous, she always says, oh my word, I'm cacking my pants. And that's exactly how I'm feeling at the minute. I'm cacking my pants. But please bear with me. I will, um, I will be sort of glancing at my notes, but this story is right here. It's me. It's my life. And um, where did that story begin? Well, as the song goes, let's start at the very beginning. It's a very good place to start. And um, I was born in Leicester in 1960. And I don't look that old, but... And um, I lived with my mum and my sister and my dad at that time, bless him. But unfortunately, when I was two and a half, my father was killed um, on, the, on the railway. He used to work for British Rail. And uh, one day, he didn't come home. I can't remember it, but my sister, bless her heart, is here. She remembers it. Every painful minute of it, she remembers. But, so that left the three of us. And I remember being with my mum and my sister, and it was a special time. We, you know, poor, poor Elaine, my sister, during the summer holidays, there was little sister. You know, everywhere she went, I was with her. I was like a yeah, thorn in her side. <laughs> Still am, I think. Um, but anyway, yeah. And um, at that time, I, I used to be teased at school because I didn't have a dad. Because back in the 60s, it wasn't the norm. You know, it was quite unusual not to have mum, dad. But we didn't have a dad. And I was teased quite a bit. So anyway, um, when I was nearly nine, my mum married again to my second dad. And I call him my second dad because that's exactly what he was. He wasn't a stepfather. He wasn't a this, that and the other. He was my second dad. And he loved us so, so much. And mum and dad went on to have two boys. So we became a family with four children and a mum and dad. Unfortunately, just four months before I got married, my second dad died. And it was my brother-in-law actually walked me down the aisle at that time. Well, up to this point, we never went to church. We never had any church background, just ordinary, you know, going for weddings, funerals, christenings, but that was it. But, I, you know, I always knew there was a God. I just, God was there. I never questioned it. I just knew it. But, you know, at school, we'd have assemblies and we'd sing about God. And I never questioned it. I just knew it. I didn't know anything about him, but I knew it. Anyway, um, as I say, four months before we got married, my dad died. Got married, and nine months later, she appeared. <laughs> She's been that problem ever since, bless her heart. I love her, I love her to bits. But yeah, so nine months, you, she, you know, Amy, Amy appeared, my little girl, my little girl who I absolutely adored. And the first five years of our marriage were you know, we're a real struggle. You know, we, we struggled to pay the bills because obviously, you know, sort of only being married for nine months and then I gave up work to look after Amy. Um, so all of a sudden there's one salary. You know, we'd only been married nine months, we've got a mortgage. And so it was really difficult at that time. But I thought we were happy. Thought I was happy. Um, but that wasn't to be. Paul at that time was, uh, was a village policeman in Counterthought where we live. And so he periodically he'd pop home for a cup of tea and, you know, always knew where he was because he was in the village. And then he changed his job and went to work for the CID. Well, if any of you have ever watched Ashes to Ashes or Life on Mars, you know, how rough and tumble, you know, I'm one of the lads, you know, go out drink as much as you possibly can, you know, and all this, lot and the other. That's exactly what life became. So we, we, oh, by this time, I forgot, poor old Hayley. And two years, <laughs> two years later, I had Hayley um, after Amy. So we got two girls. 
anyway, yeah, so that left me and the girls often just on our own while Paul was out working and partying. Anyway, just before our fifth wedding anniversary, um, things just took a turn for the worst. And uh, Paul was one of these that it just create an argument, an argument about nothing. But that, because we were arguing, it gave him the excuse to walk out and go. And he'd often just walk around the block and calm down and then come back again. But this particular night, he didn't come home. I had no idea where he was. Anyway, I rang my mum in a panic and she came over and we found out that he'd actually gone back to his parents' house. And he told me that he didn't love me anymore. And that was it. He, he'd left. Anyway, he left for ever such a long time. It was a week. And then he decided, actually, perhaps life with me wasn't that bad. So he came back. And things were OK to start with. But then, again, he started to be quite argumentative and nasty. Anyway, um, one particular... Um, can't remember the day, it doesn't matter. One day we, we I taken the children to swimming lessons and um, then I came back home and this was about five years after, actually thinking about it, it was five years after. I took the girls swimming, came back home and there was a note on the side, on the work surface, saying that he'd gone again. But this time he was going for good. And I, my world sank. I'd got two small children, got a mortgage house. I got a part-time job, but it, no way did it pay enough to be able to cope with all the bills and all the worry. And one thing that really hurt was I was so desperate because I grew up without a dad and I didn't want that for my girls. I wanted my girls to have that that family, that husband, you know, that husband and father and family, you know, the fairy tale. That's what I wanted my girls to have, not to be. Anyway, Paul was uh, was gone. As I say, we had no church background at all, but during that time, I used to take the girls to the Mums and Tots group at church. And uh, it was lovely. We used to sing lots of nice little songs and you know, sort of I was building a relationship up with the, with the church people and then periodically we'd go on a Sunday and I always managed to be there when it was given out of books for good attendance for Sunday school, even though we'd not perhaps not been, but the girls always got a book. Anyway, um, yeah, it was... So I'm looking at my notes, I'm so scared. <laughs> anyway, yeah... Um, you're perhaps thinking to me, you know, he'd been, been twice. Why put up with this? And as I say, it was because I was scared. I was really scared of being on my own and being, having to look after the children. The weight of responsibility was just crushing me. But anyway, then one day, five years again, February 1995, I was going to Christian Praise. One, one of the ladies at church said she was going to Christian Praise, which was a, a place where all the Christians from Leicester, Leicestershire and the, the surrounding areas used to meet at, at Granby, uh, yeah, to Monfort Hall. And um, I said that I'd give this lady a, a lift and um, I didn't really want to, want to go, but because I'd given, uh, I'd said I'd give her a lift, I thought, I really, I've got to go. Anyway, Paul was home at this time because he, he came back again. He came back again. Anyway, um, yeah, so we're going to Christian praise and I can remember it being an absolute amazing time. Of I, I love singing. I'm not a very good singer, but I love singing. And, you know, sort of amazing time of worship and hearing things about God and Jesus that I'd never heard before. And then at the end of the evening... Um, the guy on the stage said, oh, if you, you know, want to be prayed for to become a Christian, come down to the front, go into the garden room just at the side and somebody will be there to pray for you. And I thought, well, I don't, I don't need to do that. I've been going to church for about nine years by this time. And um, all of a sudden I got a push in my back, you know how you do. And God was saying to me, go, go and be prayed for. 
and I went down into this room and there was this elderly couple and um, they, they started to pray for me to be baptised in the spirit. And the next minute I'm lying flat on the floor, wondering what on earth was going on, crying my eyes out, but yet feeling so, so peaceful, so peaceful. And I got up and I was just so full of joy. And then that was the beginning of the worst year of my life. I went home, I was telling Paul about, oh, you know, Jesus this, and he was not happy. Not happy one bit. He was accusing me of poisoning the girls' minds with all this God stuff. And, you know, not very, not very happy at all. So anyway, after a time, he left again. This is left number three time. And, but you know, when he, uh, the first time I say I was really scared, this time I was, I was anxious and I was, you know, it was devastated, but I wasn't scared. I just knew that God was there. I'd got God. I wasn't on my own. Anyway, I'm in home on my own. He'd gone, he cleared off. And um, God one morning said to me, read 1 Corinthians 7 in your Bible. Well, I didn't know the Bible at all. I picked up the Good News Bible and I read it. And one of the little headings was questions about marriage. I was like, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. Well, I read it and there was so much in there that was relevant to my circumstance, but I didn't really know what I was supposed to be holding on to. So I put it down. Anyway, a few days later, six o'clock in the morning, God woke me again. Read 1 Corinthians 7. And I just went, Lord, I've read it. I don't get it. I don't understand it. He said, read it in the message. So I get the message out. And what it says in the message is, if the unbelieving husband walks out, let him go. Let him go in peace. You never know wife. How you handle this may not only bring your husband back to you, but back to God. And, you know, it was at that point I knew, because I knew, that Paul was going to come home. But I also knew, because I knew, that he was also going to come back to God. So I got a hold on in there, through the storm, through the awfulness, through the nastiness, through the arguments. And that's what we did. Anyway, went to my, my vicar and I was telling him and he was just saying, you know, you've got all, we, we were doing an Alpha course. Alpha was only just starting at that time. I went out every night, you know, do, not every night. That's a bit of an exaggeration. I went out to do, to lead, help lead an Alpha course. Someone from the church had come in and look after the girls. So there I am. My marriage is absolutely rock bottom falling apart and I'm like yeah, yeah, yeah. let's do Alpha you know let's get on with Alpha it was amazing and uh, you know it was just that joy that I'd got and all of my friends were saying oh, bless her she thinks he's coming back she really thinks he's coming back bless her we ought to pray for her we ought we really had ought to pray for her it's because I just knew because I knew that he was coming back Anyway, he did come back. Hey! He came back in the October and everything was fine. We were all getting on really well and one thing and another. And then it started to go nasty again. I thought, oh my goodness me, not again. But Lord, you told me. You told me he'd come back. You told me he'd come back to you. I couldn't understand it. Had I got it wrong? Had I really got it wrong? Anyway went to see T Tony the vicar at that time said would you like me to come round and see him well he's only like five foot and a fag paper and I thought oh my goodness if you come round you really are taking your life into your hands it's like going Daniel in the lion's den I said no no please no don't go round don't go round well I'll come round no 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 time's not right anyway that was from the October boxing day 
we usually go to, the, our family always used to get together, we still do actually, on a boxing day, all together. But he was, he was not feeling well, bless him. So he decided to stay at home, which in many ways I was quite thankful because he was horrible to be around. And we, we went over to my sister's, came back. He actually rang me and he was asking me when I was coming home. He was being quite nice. So I thought, oh, oh, might have had a change of heart. So I could really quite, I couldn't wait to get back to him really, but no, that was not to be. Anyway, the very next day, the day after Boxing Day, we were going, taking the children to the pantomime in Loughborough. And Paul gets up and he said, it's no good. I can't stay here. This is not working. And he was going again. Oh, my goodness. My heart sank. But I thought, no, we're going to the pantomime. So there we are and going, oh, no, he isn't. Oh, yes, he is. <laughs> You know, oh no, it's breaking down again. But on the way to the pantomime, I went to Tony and I said, now's the time, go round, go round and see him, which he did. He did go around and I rang Tony and I said, have you been round to see him? And he said, yeah, he said, unfortunately, he said, he's, he's not coming home. And I thought, oh. but I knew because I knew he was coming home and he was coming back to God. And I still knew because I knew that he was going to come home and he was coming back to God. Anyway, it was uh, New Year's Eve, so we went. We were on our own again. And we were at that time, every time he went, me and the girls, and I bet Amy can remember this, me and the, me and the girls used to, every night, every night we'd sit on the bed and all three of us would pray. We'd pray for him and give him over to the Lord and we'd pray for us all. We, it was quite a special time, actually. Even though it was really hard, it was a really special time. And um, anyway, the, it was New Year's Eve, and we were going around to some friends from church and um, for a New Year's Eve party. And I remember sitting in the corner, crying my eyes out, and I'm thinking, is this really going to be a happy New Year? Is it really? Anyway, that was that. 2nd of January, um, going back to my notes again. Yeah, the 2nd of January, there was a knock on the door and we got a glass front door and there was Tony and say, five foot of bag paper. He said, I've got somebody here to see you. And I went, oh. Anyway, and then from the, behind him, there was Paul. And Tony said, can he come in? I said, yeah, you can come in, come in. Anyway, he came in, he got a bag with him. He'd only got socks in it, but he got a bag with him. <coughs> anyway, he came in and he said, he said he was sorry for all that he'd put us through. And I couldn't believe my ears because that was the first time that he'd ever actually acknowledged and said he was sorry for what he'd put us through. And then he turned around Remember what I said? If the unbelieving husband walks out, let him go, let him go in peace. You never know, wife, how you handle this may not only bring your husband back to you, but back to God. I didn't know what I'd got to handle. Very quickly, I knew what I'd got to handle because he actually admitted to me that he'd been having an affair. And at the bottom of my, my world fell out. But I looked him in the eye and I just said to him, it is only by the grace of God that I can forgive you. I knew me myself, I couldn't, but I knew God. He was coming back to God and it was how I handled this. He was coming back to God. Anyway, Paul was then telling me that he, he wasn't well. He looked dreadful and on New Year's Eve, he'd decided that life was so awful, he didn't really like himself, that he was going to um, jump off of Swain Street Bridge in front of a train. How ironic. But something was pulling him back and he didn't. Some, some voice was telling him not to do it. Thank you, God. And um, anyway, we took him to the doctors and we ended up going up to Glen... Uh, 
the general hospital and he was severely, severely depressed. And he kept saying to me on the way there, they're not keeping me in. If they, keep me, if they want to keep me in, there's going to be a fight. I said, look, well, just do what you're told for once in your life. Just do what you're told. Anyway, they didn't keep him in, thank, you know, but it was down to me to look after him. And during this time, it was, it was really hard. It was really hard. I felt, you know, I felt, how did I deal with this betrayal? I'd look at myself and I'd think, it's no wonder he went off with somebody else. Look at you. Look at you. And my self-esteem was literally non-existent. Felt dreadful, absolutely dreadful. But we carried on. Anyway, on the 2nd of March, 2nd of March, 1996, yeah, thanks, so. <laughs> yeah, the 2nd of March, today, 1996, we were having a bring and share time at the vicarage with all of the, you know, the youth workers, because I was helping to lead the youth, and I said to Paul, you're going to come with me, and he went, oh, no. <laughs> He said, and I thought, there's no way he's going to come. Anyway, he said, yes, I will come. He said, oh, I've got a shed load of brownie points to earn with you. I said, yeah, <laughs> yes, you have. So anyway, he came along and he says, but I'm telling you now, if any of them says anything, I'm going to take them out. And I thought, oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness me. But never mind, we'll go. Anyway, we were in the kitchen. We were in the kitchen and we were singing, there was singing songs, they were drinking beer, and we had an absolute fantastic time. We get home and thankfully the girls were actually not there that night because they were staying at my sister's. And Paul was saying, oh, you know, what is it? What is it about them people? What have they got? And I went, Jesus, they've got Jesus. And I was talking to him and he was listening to me. Anyway, we gets into bed and it was only, we'd only been there about five minutes. And the next minute he's thrashing in the bed, literally thrashing in the bed and screaming out, they don't want me to do it, they don't want me to do it. And I thought, oh my goodness, what's going on here? The bedclothes were going, you know, his arms were fla failing. and Oh, it was awful. And I thought, but the only thing I knew to do was to pray, to just pray over him. Anyway, then all of a sudden it just went calm. And he went, oh, and he was sweating, sweat, he was wet, wet through. And he said to me, oh my goodness, he said, that was horrendous. He said, I've just had, he said, I felt like I'd got black hands on one, holding one arm and white arms on the, you know, holding on the other, pulling me, pulling me backwards and forwards. And they wouldn't, they wouldn't let me go. They wouldn't let me go. And then all of a sudden, the black hands let him go. And the white hands had got him. And I'm going, yes, yes, bring it on. I said, look, I've got a book. I've got a book downstairs called Why Jesus. I've got, I'm going down to get it. I'm going down to get it. And I thought, right, I'm downstairs looking for this book. Couldn't find this book. And the next minute, he's screaming again, Sue, Sue. I thought, oh, no, not again. Went running back upstairs, and he was like, bolt up. Right? He went, I've just seen him. I said, who have you seen? He said, I've just seen Jesus at the bottom of our bed. He held out his hands, and he said, Paul, trust in me. And I thought, oh, my goodness, oh, my goodness, he's met with Jesus. Why wasn't I there? <laughs> Why wasn't I there when I was looking for this stupid book that I never even found? Anyway, the next morning I goes to church. Paul wasn't coming to church with me. He wanted to. He desperately wanted to. We couldn't because we were having mum and the boys to come for dinner and he'd gone to pick them up. And I went to Tony and I said, you never guess what's happened. And he went, right, calm down, calm down. Let's be patient. Let's just see what happens from here on in. Anyway, Paul did start to come to church. He did start to come to church. And he started to help with the youth group. He formed a band with some of the guys in the church and they caught, I, I dreamt actually he was going to be playing in a Christian rock band. And there he was, 
doing this uh, in this band and they called it Eye to Eye because he'd met Jesus, Eye to Eye. If you want a CD, we've got loads of them. They make great bird scarers. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Anyway, later on, he was confirmed. We were in a Church of England church, so it was confirmed. We went on to lead countless Alpha courses, and he was licensed as an evangelist with the Church of England. And he was... <laughs> but the main thing was... He began to work for a Christian organisation, which is Christian Vision for Men, because he didn't want men like he was. And the men that he was having to deal with as a police officer in the sex offenders unit, he wanted to see them, the lives transformed by Jesus, because his life had been transformed. Marvellous. What about me? Well, it took a long time to build the trust, as you can imagine. I remember going to give him my testimony once, and I said, I only actually trust him 90%. And this lady said to me, oh, you need prayer for healing. You need prayer to forgive him. I said, I've forgiven him. No, 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 no. And I thought, oh, dear, have I really got this wrong? And another lady came up to me, and she said, no, because the other 10%, you trust in God. And I went, Absolutely. Never will I make myself that vulnerable again. Never. And it was so difficult to come to terms with. But on our 24th wedding anniversary, which happened to fall on a Sunday, I goes into church and then halfway through the service said, right, we're now going to have a renewal of the wedding vows. And he'd arranged with the vicar for us to renew our wedding vows in the service. I didn't know we were doing it, but we did. And I can honestly say that was such a special time because when we first got married, we got married in church, but did we acknowledge God in it? Absolutely not. But this time we knew that God was right in the middle of our marriage and it was a real special time. So now, everything all lonky dory Oh, come on. You know, this is life. Life's hard. Life's hard. We have our ups and downs. As many of you who know us, we bicker <laughs> all the time. <laughs> I'm always telling him off. <laughs> but, you know, God had got a plan for us. And we've, he's taken us to places we, we could have only have dreamt of together. And, you know, we, we are still on this journey. But I know, I know that there are ladies here that have got similar experiences of that betrayal, of that lack of self-esteem, that have been deeply hurt. I can't... This is my story. This is my story. And God has a story for you too. He has a story for you too. And what he's got might be even better than you could ever imagine. Well, it will be. I can guarantee that. So... As Louise says at the beginning of this, if you're feeling that pain, then please, please go and get prayer. That was 28 years ago today. Can you believe? One, one o'clock, one o'clock on the 3rd of March was when Jesus, when Jesus broke into our marriage, into Paul's life. And actually you've met him because he was the one serving you the tea tonight. <laughs> right. 28 years ago, can I just, and I'm, I'll be quiet and I'll be quick, I promise. I need to bring it up to date. Lots of things have happened over those 28 years where I could be here till Christmas. But this week, oh my goodness me, what a nightmare week we've had. What a nightmare week we've had. Should have been going to Harrogate on Tuesday for the New Wine Leaders Conference. We get home from church on Sunday. And our house was under water. We'd had a burst water tank. And Paul was there with the bucket underneath the, the ceiling light in the lounge. Water everywhere. Consequently, we had to turn the water off. We had to turn the electric off. And sitting there in the dark rings the emergency people. Yeah, we'll be with you between three and seven. I thought, well, don't come at seven. You won't see anything. Anyway, 
I, I said to Paul, he wasn't handling it very well, so I said, look, you clear off. <laughs> go, 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 go over to my brothers. I'll be fine. Just go over to my brothers. I thought he was best off out of the way, I tell you. Go, go to my brothers. Anyway, I packed him off, and I'm sitting there, and it was 7 o'clock when the plumber came. I thought, oh, for goodness sake. Opens the door, and there was this big, and he was massive, <laughs> this big black man, in my doorway, and I thought, oh, come on in, <laughs> come on in. Bearing in mind, well, I couldn't see a thing. We'd got candles, and it was a throwback to the 70s, if you remember it. You know, we were sat there in candlelight, and this big black man, and I thought, I must admit, and I'm wrong, but I felt really quite anxious, so I said, I'm just going to go and get my neighbour. So I went round to the next door, and I said, well, come in, come in, come in with me. Anyway, he came in with me, and what he's talking about, he said, well, I can't really see can't really see very much. I thought, you're not joking, are you? Anyway, he said, oh, we'll come, we'll, well, I'll have to come back tomorrow. I said, oh, can I have your phone number? I thought, yeah, I've heard this story before. I'll be back tomorrow. So I said, have you got your phone number? So he gave me his phone number, and I, I said to him, what's your name? He said, Emmanuel. Emmanuel, God with us. I thought, whoa, whoa, whoa. Anyway, went downstairs, so I'd got Emmanuel's telephone number. And we on our on one of our walls, we've got a wire art that just says John 316 on it. And he went, Oh, John 316. And I went, Oh yes, said it's uh, a you know, a verse out of the Bible. And he went, Yes, I, I'm a born again Christian. Hello, sister. <laughs> So, oh, bless your heart. And I tell you what, my attitude to him, I could have kissed this man. I thought, <laughs> and I went up to him and I'm like, oh, get, just give us a hug, you know. <laughs> and, you know, I just thought, you know, God is with us. God is with us. And in all of the mess, all of, the, we're, we're homeless at the minute. We're, well, no, we're not. No, we're not. Because my, bro my brother's very kindly said that we can go and stay in his house because, at the moment, we've got drying out equipment for the next three weeks. No flooring, no nothing. But you know what? Does it matter? No. No. I remember hearing once, always count your blessings before you count your problems. And actually, your problems become even less. And with that, I'm going to finish. Thank you. Thank you.